Welcome to the series of studies on the church that Jesus wants. Jesus wants his church back. In study number six, we're looking at the subject of a senior pastor or a multiple eldership. What is the pattern that God is looking for in the leadership of the church that he wants? Well, we've seen that there are three major layers of New Testament church ministry. Firstly, there's the priesthood of all believers. That's the every member ministry of the church. Secondly, you have the eldership of local churches throughout the New Testament, a group of mature Holy Spirit appointed leaders who shepherd the congregation. And thirdly, the fivefold traveling ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers equipping the body of Christ. Now, in our last session, in session number five, we looked at the clergy laity divide. Or should we have a priesthood of all believers? Now, this is the first of those, those layers the priesthood of all believers the every member of the church ministry? Or should it just be one man who's controlling all of the ministry? We saw in that last session that the Bible teaches an every member ministry in the church. Well, in session number six, we will look at the biblical model of the New Testament church leadership and ministry function. And here we're looking specifically at the, the second point, which is the eldership, the leadership of local churches. Who are the elders? They're a group of mature, Holy Spirit appointed leaders who shepherd the congregation. Now, the origin of multiple leadership actually goes back to God himself, the divine model, God himself. The triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because they are the multiple eldership of the universe. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God. The word for God there in the Hebrew is Elohim. And that's a plural word. Eloah would be the singular. Elohim is the plural. But note in the Semitic languages, one is singular, two is dual, not, not, not a plural, it's dual. Plurality begins with number three. Number three is plural. And so from the very beginning, we see that God introduces himself as a triune God. And in Genesis chapter one, verses one to three, we see the operation um, of the Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit the three-in-one God revealed from the beginning. And the use of the word Elohim confirms that to us. Also, way back in the beginning, we see that uh, Satan rebelled against the plan of God. And so we have the battle, Satan versus God. The battle begins. From the beginning, Satan challenged the divine triune leadership and authority of God, the Elohim and wanted to establish his own model of singular authority. And he said, I will arise. The satanic rebellion is recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. Let's see what it says. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, now notice there are five I wills that Satan expresses here. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, Satan was setting his will against the will of God. The will of God, when it came to leadership, was a triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Satan wanted to exalt himself. I will. And this is 
what he was doing in his rebellion. As part of Satan's rebellion, we see that the nature of that rebellion gets expressed in what we could call the Jethro tragedy. Jethro was an idol-worshipping priest, and he gives five false prophecies to Moses to be the exalted supreme leader of Israel. In Exodus 18.1, it says, Jethro, the priest of Midian. But who were the Midianites? Numbers 25, 1-3, tells us that the Midianites were idol worshippers, and that included worshipping Baal. In Numbers 10, 29 to 33, we read that Jethro, also known as uh, Hobab, rejected the invitation of Moses to join Israel. In Judges chapter 6, the Midianites were idol-worshipping enemies of Israel, and they kept Israel uh, in captivity. Now, the problem with uh, Jethro is he offered a solution to a pastoral problem. You see, the problem was there was only one Moses, one person who had met with God. But there were three million people wanting to hear an answer from God. So people were lined up from morning till afternoon and they were getting weary. Jethro came along and he saw this problem and, and using his uh, wisdom, he said to Moses, what you're doing is not good. And in Exodus 18, we record how Jethro said to Moses, look, this is what you should do. And he basically uh, offered to him a multi-tiered pyramidal leadership style with Moses on the top. It was a pyramidal hierarchy with Moses on the top. And then under him, there were the captains of the thousands and the captains of the hundreds and the fifties and the tens. This was in direct contradiction to what was in the heart of God. God wasn't looking for some pyramidal hierarchical system. He was wanting to bring these three million people to Mount Sinai and equip them with the same anointing as prophets, priests and kings that Moses was given. And if you had these three million people equipped with the same anointing, you would then have a powerful nation, a prophetic, kingly, priestly nation that would be able to take the gospel to the nations of the world. If one Moses could reach three million people, how many could three million people with the same anointing reach? So we end up, like this diagram shows, with Moses sitting at the top of the pyramid. But the prophecies, the five prophecies of Jethro were all lies. They were in contradiction to the divine solution, which began actually in Exodus chapter 19, where God said that he would make them to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a prophetic nation. Well, Moses went through that experience of the Jethro solution. And, and in Numbers chapter 11, we find that every one of those prophecies were false and they didn't come to pass. And the people are crying out. And Moses is crying out for a solution. And the Lord provides to him the divine solution and says to him, get 70 of the men who you know who are elders and bring them around the tabernacle. And you stand there with them. And I'm going to take the anointing that's on you and I'm going to put it on them as well. And they together will lead the nation of Israel. You know, there's a biblical principle of multiplicity in, in leadership and in wisdom and counsel. And we read this in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord 
is not quickly broken. This principle in the Bible, and we'll see some more verses on this, is telling us that standing alone is not the solution. We need to have two or maybe three uh, at least, just like the divine model of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that we can have the wisdom of God and be able to stand strong in the face of all the challenges that come against us. This biblical principle of multiplicity in leadership, in counselling, in bringing the wisdom of God, I mean, just as the Bible says in other places, it says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's in Deuteronomy. It's, Paul quotes it also in Corinthians. And here we see in Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, Plans go awry, but in the multitude of counsellors, they are established. Proverbs 24, 6, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counsellors there is safety. This biblical principle of multiplicity in ministry, we also see was practised by Jesus. Jesus sent the twelve out two by two. In Mark 6, 7, he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. In Luke 10 and verse 1, we find that Jesus sent the 70 disciples also two by two. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to to go. See, every New Testament church was led by multiple eldership. And yet today, when we have a look at the structure and leadership and ministry style um, of the church all around the world, the general principle is that you have one man who is the senior pastor of, um, of the church. Uh, you might have a, a board, a board of elders or a board of deacons. And most of the congregation are passive and they're observers, they're spectators um, of the ministry that's going on in the church. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted to have every member of the church active. That's the priesthood of all believers. And when it came to the leadership, the ministry, to replicate his own ministry style of the divine triunity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he wanted to have a multiple leadership. In the New Testament church, every church was shepherded by a multiple leadership. Most churches today are led by single leaders. Yet they consider themselves to be biblical and normal. Well, they're normal according to the practice of today, but not according to what existed in the New Testament church. Let's have a look at some of these cities. Jerusalem, the founding city of the New Testament church. From Acts 2 to Acts chapter 8, uh, and we see this in Acts chapter 6 and verse 2, originally the apostles are the ones who led the church. They were the multiple leadership of the church. The twelve summoned the multitudes of the disciples. In Acts 15 verse 6, we see that over the years there had been a development in Jerusalem, and now it was the apostles and elders. So apart from the apostles, they were mentoring others, raising them up into leadership, and they were the elders of the church. In Acts 21 and verse 18, we find that when Paul comes back to Jerusalem after a number of years of being away, there were no longer any of the, the original apostles there. They had all gone out on their apostolic uh, missionary journeys, and now you only have the elders. And they were meeting at the home of James, James, the brother of Jesus, who was also one of the elders. This is not James the apostle. This is James, uh, the brother of Jesus, who was one of the elders in the church. And in Acts 21, verse 18, that we fi finally see, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. No longer any mention 
um, of the apostles. So there had been a development and growth in the church. It began with the, uh, the, the 12 apostles. Uh, it then was the apostles and elders, like at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. But, but by Acts chapter 21, it was the elders who were shepherding uh, the church in Jerusalem. Then we can look at the Judean churches in Acts 11 and verse 30, where relief was sent uh, to the church uh, and was actually sent to the elders of the Judean churches by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And in Acts 11, 22 to 26, we read, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas uh, to go as far as uh, Antioch. You see here, after the Judean churches had been established, we now find that uh, there's a revival taking place um, in Antioch. And the, the apostles in Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas to go and see this revival. And when he gets there, he finds that this great revival is, is an awesome opportunity. And so it says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In Acts 13, 1 to 2, we read some more about what was happening in Antioch. Because although it began with Barnabas and, and Paul, they were beginning to train others. And others were developing in leadership. Now they had a leadership of five people. So in Acts 13, 1 to 2, it says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have appointed them. Moving on to the Cilician churches, in Acts 14.23, when Paul and Barnabas had gone out on their missionary journey, they'd been traveling for two years, and we find that in Acts 14.23, on their way back, after those two years, they visited all of the churches that they had established on their outward journey. And so it says, so when they had appointed elders in every church. Now, this was the New Testament pattern. They established elders in every church. These are the ones who were going to be pastoring the church, shepherding the church, teaching and encouraging the church, helping the church to grow. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. We find that when Paul came to Ephesus, there were 12 disciples. But these disciples had been baptized under the baptism of John the Baptist and didn't know that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had occurred. So Paul said, you need to be baptized with the baptism that Jesus uh, preached. And so they were baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened then? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the church had begun to grow. And then when Paul came back and revisited the church, he was on a journey by boat and he couldn't leave the, the Ephesus harbour, which was at Miletus. And so in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 and onwards, we read what happened. So in verses 17 and 28, it says, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Notice he called for the elders of the church. He didn't call the pastor. He didn't call the bishop. No, he didn't call the priest. No, he called the elders because the elders were the shepherds of the church. And he said to them in verse 28, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The word for elders is presbyteros, or in the plural presbyteroi, and the word for 
overseers, sometimes translated bishops, is episkopos, and in the plural, episkopoi. And notice it says here that the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, the church is precious, purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to be honouring what Jesus purchased. He wants his church back. He wants his church to have a vital, powerful, multiple ministry, expressing the fullness of who God is, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in the midst um, of, a, of a community who are desperately looking for answers. Anyway, we come to the Cretan churches. And in Titus 1 and verse 5, we find that Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, had taken the church to a certain level. But then he left Titus behind to continue on with the work that Paul had begun. So Titus was given this apostolic uh, commission. Um, and it says, Paul says to him in Titus 1.5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders, plural, elders, in every city. See, every city was to have multiple eldership, as I commanded you. When we come to Philippi, in Philippians 1 verse 1, we read, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, the episcopoi, and the deacons. They had a multiple leadership. Then we find the Hebrew churches, whether it was Paul or somebody else writing uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, at least it was Pauline thought. And in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, remember your leaders, plural again, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. See, the leaders were multiple. Hebrews 13, 17 also says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. And Hebrews 13 and verse 24, greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people those from Italy send their greetings. So this letter that had been written uh, from Rome uh, to the Hebrew uh, Christians in a number of different uh, fellowships, they were encouraged to honour their leaders, multiple leaderships in all of the Hebrew churches. What about the churches in Turkey? Well, we find that there were five major provinces in Turkey and they're mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered uh, throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, these were the five provinces um, um, throughout Turkey. Uh, and in all of those places, the gospel had gone and churches um, had been established. And now Peter was writing to them. And in 1 Peter 5 and verse 1, we see that uh, Peter says, to the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder. Now, he could have said, I'm an apostle. No, he said, I'm a fellow elder. And I'm writing to the elders as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also uh, will share in the glory to be revealed. So we're going to share in his glory. And he wants us to be the sort of church that he had planned from the very beginning before the church made a mess of things in Revelations 1, 2, and 3. We see that in the first century, man had taken over the church, but Jesus wants his church back. More about that a little bit later. Look at the advice that James gave to the believers. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And in James five fourteen, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name um, of the Lord. He didn't say call the pastor. It says call the elders, because the elders are the representatives um, of Christ leading that church, shepherding, mentoring, 
coaching, training, equipping um, the local uh, congregation. At least that's the way it was in the New Testament. But what about the heavenly church pattern? You know, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, we read, after this. After what? After the mess of Revelation 1, 2 and 3. So Revelation 4, 1 is saying to us, after this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. See, Jesus was calling John and wanted to show John the church of the future. Now, we know what the church was like in the New Testament because every congregation was initially led in a multiple um, eldership, multiple leadership. But then the church went into decline. And now Jesus was wanting to call the church back to the pattern. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, his message to the seven churches, he called them, he said, repent, remember from where you have fallen, come back again, do again as you did um, in the very beginning. And now he's saying to John, come up here, I'm going to give you a revelation of the blueprint of the church of the future. And that's given to us in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. So here in Revelation 4 and verse 1, when it says, after this, after what? After the mess of Revelation 2 to 3. See, man had taken over the church and Jesus wants his church back. Revelation 4 to 5 is the blueprint of the church of the future. See this diagram? This is a diagram of part of what's in Revelation 4 and 5. Jesus is the center of the church. The seven spirits of God are moving in the church. There's prayer and worship and singing of a new song. They have multiple leaders. There's 24 elders seated around the throne. The people who are gathered together are called kings and priests under God. They're a royal priesthood. They're united, one body. And they are gathered out of every tribe, kindred, nation and tongue. They are a missional church. They have total evangelism, fulfilling the Great Commission, and then the seven seals, the mysteries of the last days, are being opened up to them. See, the heavenly church pattern, in Revelation 4 and verse 4, it says, Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold um, on their heads. And in verses 10 to 11, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were cre uh, created and have their, their being. You see, the heavenly church had the same model of multiple leadership and jesus taught us to pray in in matthew chapter 6 your will be done on earth as it is in heaven why should we be doing it differently than what jesus taught us to do he wants his church back and he wants the fullness of the power and the love and the and the glory and the anointing of the father son and holy spirit to be fully manifest within the church and if we want that fullness, we need to come back to the way that God wanted to have his church from the very beginning. So what's the origin of this senior pastor model? I mean, today we have this model, and I don't blame uh, church pastors today. They're just following what's been the norm for you know, more than a thousand years. But if we're a true pastor, a true shepherd, a true elder, then we should have the heart of Jesus and the heart of the Father and desire to have the biblical model because with a biblical model, we get biblical results. We don't just want to play church. We don't want to set up kingdoms or clubs of our own personal power and authority. A true pastor, 
a true shepherd, a true elder, desires to have the heart of God manifest in the midst of the church. But the origin, just like we saw back with the fall of Lucifer, who said, I will arise. See, he rose up against what God was wanting to do. And because he was rising up against what God wanted to do, he became the enemy of what God was wanting. Let's not be the enemies of what God wants. Let's walk in the pattern, the plan, the purpose that God has given for the church for today. We see that origin of the senior pastor system being evident in the New Testament church. And what a tragedy that was. After the Apostle John had been released from the Isle of Patmos and he comes back to Ephesus. And in 3 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, in a church just outside of Ephesus, there was a rebellion. There were three elders who were leading this congregation. There was Gaius, there was Demetrius, and there was Diotrephes. But we find that Diotrephes, he wanted to become the number one power in the church. See, one of the problems that we face is our own humanity, our own ambitions. And Diotrephes, he wanted to have the power in the church. And so he conducted a coup d'etat against these other leaders. Now they wrote to the Apostle John and, and asked John for help. And John in his response in 3 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, this is what he wrote. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Now, here we have the first example of someone taking over a church to become the senior leader of the church. Here is the origin of the senior pastor system in the history um, of the church. Well, if we have a look at this diagram, it looks like a chaotic mess. Actually, What's in this diagram uh, is a ladder. The two long white lines represent the two legs of the ladder. All of the little white lines represent the different rungs of the ladder. The red dots uh, you know, represent members of the, the congregation. The white dots, uh, the, maybe the, uh, the, the elders. Those yellow arrows represent Satan coming in and out and bringing chaos because the church is in uh, disunity, because it's not walking in the biblical model. We find that the ladder is broken and splintered and there's no power to stop Satan from coming to the church. It's a divided church. A divided church and leadership allows Satan freedom to move in and out of the city at will. And he will destroy the city. But we have been called to become the ecclesia of God. The ecclesia of God, the, the, the church, the ones who have been called out to protect and provide vision for the city. See, the true ecclesia is uh, not just a church, not an organization, a building. The original ecclesia was the city council. And in the spiritual realm, the church is a city council. This is of the elders and the congregation together providing protection for the city, imparting wisdom, imparting direction, uh, helping the city to grow and to build, to protect it against all kinds of evil. But when the church is in disunity and the church is divided, Satan is free to work, work and to do his evil. 
Well, God saw this situation, and going back into the Old Testament, we read in Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, that God put an advertisement um, in uh, the book of Ezekiel. He says, I sought for a man. See, it's God's advertisement. You know, looking for a man. But he's looking for someone who's going to make a difference in their city. I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land and behalf of the city, on behalf of the nation, that I would not destroy it. But no one responded to the advertisement. God said, I found no one. I found no one. You see, Satan attacks to destroy the city and its people. As we see in this diagram, if you have a united leadership, the elders and the people in the congregation, the city is protected by the ecclesia. Those black lines, uh, the satanic attack, they can't get in. See, the church, the ecclesia led by united eldership, it's powerful. Satan's influence over the city is cut off by the ecclesia, taking control of the spiritual atmosphere of the city. This is the church that Jesus wants. He wants a church that's mighty and powerful, that destroys the power of Satan, that releases the power of the gospel to transform the city. And when the ecclesia is restored, as we see in this diagram, the ladder is rebuilt. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the angels can ascend and descend and we, we can have the presence of God and its fullness within the city. A city protected and transformed can happen. It is possible if we, the people of God, will humble ourselves, if we will be the church that Jesus wants. Satan will no longer be able to enter and control the, the city at will. He's going to be under attack, just, just as the scriptures tell us in Matthew 16, Hosea chapter 1, Isaiah 62, Esther chapter 2, Proverbs 25, 28. You see, when we build the walls, when we take guard over the gates of the city, when we have the ecclesia of God fully restored, when we become the church that Jesus wants, when we have the sort of leadership that Jesus wants, then we can get the results that Jesus wants. The total transformation of our cities, of our nations, our communities, to be filled with the power of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Is this in your heart? I believe this is the heart of Jesus. And he's calling for us to have the same heart, that we too can pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <music>